You're listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad. Yourself? Good. Uh, Broadcasting here from the RSM podcast suite here in... uh, Hot Las Vegas. It's very hot. Not so hot in here, though. I've kept it real cool. Yeah. But we've been doing this series in the uh, the IM uh, Summit here in Las Vegas, and it's been fantastic having this podcasting suite. Really excited about the session that we have here today. Uh, we're going to talk about ITDR. Yeah. Identity Threat Detection Response. Help us with that conversation. We've got Head Kovetz. He's the CEO and co-founder at Silverfort. Welcome, Head. Hey, great to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time. And we have tradition here when we have someone on the show, we have to find out about their identity origin story. Is identity (laughs) something that you chose or did it choose you? Um, It's a good question. Uh, You know, I I, uh, kind of went into the whole cybersecurity space uh, like a lot of other, um, you know, Israelis in this space to the... To the the military, 8200 unit. Before that, I I thought I'm going to be an artist. I didn't even think I'm going to go into tech. But when I was 18, you know, uh, 8200 just brought me in, and I loved it. I stayed there for six years. I was a group leader, uh, managed five teams there, doing like cyber campaigns, um, and then after that, worked for governments on on similar things. Um, so you know, because I had this experience with uh, let's say, the, the offensive side of security, it became very clear to me that at the end of the day, I mean, everybody's talking about zero-day attacks and fancy things, but if, if you're an attacker, identity is just the easiest way in. And it's, it's almost crazy how easy it is. Like, if you really want to go, like, breach into a network or move laterally inside of it, why would you bother do anything else? It, it's just so easy and exposed. Um, and that, that drove me to trying to think about why is it like this? I mean, obviously, there are a lot of solutions. So that, that is what attracted me to the space, is knowing that there's such um, a clear problem. And even though there are hundreds of solutions in the market, the problem is not solved. Still, the majority of data breaches involve stolen identities. So why is that? And is there any way to do it differently? Um, that's something that I thought a lot about and you know, really wanted to do something and I'm, I'm very glad I did. <laughs> so this space called Identity Threat Detection Response, ITDR, I feel like this maybe was started with UBA at some point in the past, and maybe it's evolved, or maybe I'm not thinking it in, in the correct terms, but that's why we've got you here, to help educate myself and others. What is ITDR in, in your perspective? So for a long time, identity security was kind of mixed into just IAM, Identity Infrastructure. Um, you know, if, if you have an IAM platform, it has some security features, obviously. But I think we got to a point where, because there are so many attacks that are leveraging stolen identities and credentials, people are realizing that we need to look at identity security as a standalone thing that we have to solve. And it kind of can't be a feature in the identity platform because most companies have a few different identity platforms. They have, they have Active Directory on-prem and they have you know, Azure AD or Okta in the cloud, and they have something for their privilege access management, and they have something in the perimeter. And all of these are from different vendors that, that are competing with each other. So there has to be a, a standalone category or solution that would look at identity threats across all these things and really focus on, on, the, on securing the identities, securing these this this attack surface that people, I think, for a long time didn't really think about as a major attack surface, but it is, you know, one of the biggest. Uh, We see that with every ransomware attack, right, where where it just spreads in the network so easily, no matter what kind of security tools you have, simply because you can take, uh, you know, a stolen account from Active Directory and use it to move to any other computer in the network. Nobody will stop you. Um, So ITDR is really about detecting and stopping these, these identity threats and, and looking at identity as an attack surface. Yeah, to me, this the whole ITDR explanation that you just gave 
is really what we call identity at the center. So if you think about the name of this podcast, it's the idea that you have all these tools throughout the network. Some of them are identity tools. Some of them are other tools like EDR. But that identity and tying off who the person is who has accounts in all those environments and is touching all those environments, doing all those things, ties back to a person. And if you have that intelligence and you can take action, you know, that's a big thing. It's not just throwing a bunch of alerts, right? It's being able to take action. So I want to take a step back if we could because you have a booth here. So you're getting to interact with a lot of identity practitioners you know, the people who listen to this show. I'm wondering, what are those people asking you at your booth about your products, about ITDR? Are they at the point where they really have a firm understanding or are they just kind of dipping their toe in the water of what this space is all about? I think most of them don't understand it yet. And this is, by the way, why um, we are trying to talk about what we actually do instead of just putting a title, you know, ITDR. It's kind of similar to how a lot of vendors are using Zero Trust as the title, right? It, it's a concept, it's a framework, it's a very important one, ITDR as well. But we should talk to, to customers about what is it that we actually do? What is the, the solution? How does it work? So that's what we try to do at the booth. And people really get it. Mm -hmm. I feel like people respond to it very well. We had hundreds of good conversations here. Uh, I did a session that, you know, a lot of people um, came to talk to me after. Uh, we also had, um, you know, uh, was very glad to find out at some point that um, Andrew Cameron from General Motors did a session uh, about their whole strategy for identity security and zero trust. And he, he had a whole slide with how we are like the missing piece because they're, they're one of our customers. Um, and that obviously got a lot of people to come to our booth and ask, you know, how can we do the same? Yeah, that's a good get. Because <laughs> he, he just expanded it in a way, by the way, I think he expanded it in a way that is, is better than how I do it in, in certain ways, just so simple. By the way, I think in general, that's what the industry needs. Mm -hmm. Much, much simpler explanations that are much more straightforward without a lot of marketing fluff, like this is what we do, this is how it plugs into your existing solutions, and this is what you get. And that's what I'm trying to do. I feel like every year at Silverfort, our story became, becomes simpler. Mm -hmm. Instead of adding more and more complexity, it's actually a simpler story every year and it just works better. Well, that's been a theme, I think, for, for this conference. We've seen some of the keynotes were around storytelling and sort of the human element and distilling things down into um, simpler, easier to understand concepts. Because yeah. if you can't articulate what it is that you're doing, you have a very difficult time getting any traction. Especially because there's so many vendors um, and I do think we're doing something very differently. So if we just use the same terms like everybody, it's hard. We're trying to really explain what is it that we do. And by the way, Jim, I think that you hit on exactly these two things um, before that, that ITDR needs to evolve in. Because, I mean, you guys are right. In many ways, this is just, this could be just rebranding of some existing things like UEBA. But I think it will not. I think it will be much more than that. And it's especially because of two changes that I, I think and I hope ITDR will bring versus the old you know, UEBA approach. One is uh, the response, which I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out what is that response. But it cannot be about detecting anomalies and sending alerts to the sim. Mm -hmm. The last thing people need is an, you know, more alerts. Nobody, I mean, they there's, sit there. there's a shortage in, in talent yeah. in the market. Nobody has enough people to handle all these alerts. It has to come with some kind of real-time automated response that will stop the attack. Especially when we're talking identity attacks, they are so fast. When, when you got an attacker in your network with a domain admin account, mm -hmm. they will take over your network you know, within an hour. They will not wait until... You get a bunch of alerts to your SIM and you go investigate them and it, it, it's way too late. So I think the response part is what a lot of the solutions that started as more of a detection tools will now need to evolve in. And that's, I think, one of the main areas where we, where we innovated. And the second it is, has to be cross-platform. It cannot be something that works only for the cloud or only for the on-prem or only for one type of, of users. It has to be across the board. By the way, that is, in my opinion, the biggest failure in identity security until now. If you think about it, identity is one of the only categories where security is just a feature inside the, the infrastructure platform, right? 
So if you get Azure, then you're using their security features. For their identities, if you're using Okta, they have their security features. In other categories of securities, it's, it's not like that. Think about um, endpoint security. You buy your endpoints themselves from one vendor or, or from a few, you know, Lenovo, HP, Dell. You don't buy endpoint protection from each of them that only works for their own endpoints. You go to vendors that specialize in endpoint security and you buy a solution that works on top of all the platforms, all the laptops. Same with network. You can buy a network security solution regardless of what kind of switches and routers you have. It's, it's a security solution that works everywhere. But identity is not. In identity, if you have five different platforms for identity, because you're hybrid, multi-cloud, whatever, each of them has its own security features within the, the infrastructure. There, there's actually not, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think we are, but I, I think there's not a good solution, or there hasn't been for a long time, that is really a, a security layer that runs on top of all of them, because they are competing with each other. Microsoft, Okta, Ping, Cyborg, they will not il allow the other one to apply a policy on their platform, right? Each of them is only doing yeah. its own thing, looking at their own piece of the puzzle. And we are trying to be the, the neutral security layer on top. And this is why I think ITDR is such an important thing, because identity security has to stop being just a feature in the infrastructure. It has to evolve into something separate from IAM. Its own capability, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it has to be standalone. It has to be something that works on top of all the identity platforms. So I'm kind of wondering, like, who from an organization then identifies that there's a problem that needs to be solved? Is it the folks that run the EDR and realize that, wow, we're not getting all the data that we need? Is it the folks from the IAM side that realize that we're managing identities in all these different places and we just have to be able to kind of make what's happening over here and we need to be able to flow our actions positive or negative to other places where that identity has access it's a great question and i think it illustrates exactly the problem i just mentioned because think about it right now in in companies you got iam teams what is that exactly is that infrastructure is that security for endpoint, it's clear, right? You got one team managing the endpoints themselves from an IT perspective, and you got another team doing endpoint security. Why is identity one team sometimes reporting to the CISO, sometimes reporting to the CIO, to the CTO, but it's one team that has to take care of the infrastructure and the security. These are two separate things. Right now, we are seeing companies from, you know, some companies have it under IT, and then these people usually care more about you know, the, the, the infrastructure side. Some companies have it under security. But I think that, I hope that as this market evolves and as identity security or ITDR become a separate thing from IAM infrastructure, companies will also evolve and have separate teams that are doing identity infrastructure and identity security. Um, but right now it is confusing. And, and yes, yeah, sometimes it's coming from people who, yeah, like the, the endpoint team or the SOC team or, but it shouldn't. You know, identity is important enough to have a team dedicated to identity security specifically. Um, some companies have them, but usually very large ones. So, so is ITDR a product class like IGA, or is it a framework like Zero Trust? It's a good question. I think that um, in many ways it's a framework. I think a lot of different solutions will now say that they're, they're doing ITDR, because in many ways they are. Right? All of these, like if you're doing uh, you know, MFA or PAM or, or many of these other things, in, in many ways you are part of, of ITDR. But I do think that ITDR is more about the brain that controls all of these different things, right? So yes, you got MFA, you got PAM, you got you know, monitoring, you got all these different things, but there has to be something in the middle, which this is what, how I think about ITDR, like the brain that applies all of these controls in the right time. So if we detect something that looks like lateral movement or like an anomaly, okay, maybe we then call the MFA. By the way, the MFA doesn't even do, need to be part of our platform. We, for example, work with all the MFA vendors. If we detect a threat in the network, we will trigger Duo, we will trigger the Azure MFA, we will trigger Okta. It doesn't need to be a part of it. What, what we are is really the policy engine, the ones that detect the threat and decide what is the right response to it. Is it 
to trigger MFA? Is it to block the user? Is it sending an alert? You know, there, there are many things you can do, and they, they don't necessarily have to be part of the ITDR policy engine. They can be things that companies already have. We are saying to customers, hey, you already have MFA. Just right now, you're using it as a, as a pretty simple control that sits on your perimeter and maybe your cloud applications. How do you like to take this existing MFA solution that you already have and extend it into the places where attacks actually happen within the, you know, the, the identity infrastructure? All these things that the MFA solutions don't cover, you know, command line tools and industrial systems and you know, all, all these file shares and, and on-prem protocols that MFA just doesn't work for because right now it's, it's all in the VPN, in the cloud applications, web apps. But you don't need to replace it. We'll just extend it to these places. We'll bring the modern security into the places where it doesn't work, the legacy systems, the service accounts, the, the infrastructure. So in a way, ITDR is just the, it's the, the policy engine or the brain that enforces the security control that you might already have when it's the right time and the right place. I think you have the policy. One thing I was thinking about there is that you know, when I think about IGA system implementation, especially like 10 years ago, we were automating a lot of things that were happening manually, right? So the business result was we were reducing the cost to the organization by doing things in an automated way. We didn't have to have people running around and provisioning access or, you know, exporting Excel files and somebody else turning them into an access for you. But I think what you're talking about with ITDR, these are things that don't happen today. So this, the business result is reduction in risk. You actually now have visibility into security data that today you do not have. These things are happening, yeah. but you can't do anything about it. Yes. By the way, I think the most exciting thing about ITDR, um, even as, you know, as opposed to other types of detection and response tools that are not around identity, is that if you're talking about detection and response outside of identity, the response is actually pretty limited. What you can do is usually send an alert you know, and, and do something retroactive, which is not great because nobody can handle these alerts and you're missing the actual attack. Or you can block. You can block the endpoint. You can block the, the network access. You know, something that is very aggressive. Now, you don't want to do that because most of the detection today is not necessarily accurate, right? You get a lot of false positives. So you, nobody wants to do that. So this choice between sending an alert or doing something very aggressive is all you got when you're talking detection and response outside of identity. But in identity, you got a third option. You can step up the authentication. That's a great option because everybody's used to it, right? Getting an MFA prompt and saying, yes, this is me. Almost two years to it. That's yeah, two years to it. By the way, they're going to do it less with ITDR because without ITDR, they need to do it every time they log in. With ITDR, they only need to do it when we think their account is maybe compromised. So it's actually less annoying and maybe there will be less automatically, you know, right. clicking on it. Um, by the way, there are other solutions for that. We have a whole, a whole uh, blog about that too. But the thing is, step up authentication as a response tool in many ways is the most effective one because you're basically letting the user tell you, is it you or not? Why have the SOC team investigate thousands of alerts if we can simply ask the user, is it you? Can you prove it? And within one click, they will tell us, yes, it is me. And you're just annoying me for no reason. And please don't, don't do it again. Yeah. And we can actually learn. We can train the algorithm. You know what? Maybe for you, it is normal to log in in the middle of the night from, you know, from another country. Maybe for you, it is normal to connect to five databases you know, on the weekend. If you can prove it, that it's you, we can train our algorithms to understand what is normal. That's something you don't get with regular UEBA. Mm -hmm. UEBA, you know, theoretically you can train it, but nobody does. Here, it's almost like you are crowdsourcing your alerts to the users. Right. Let them tell us what are the true positives. If I can tell the SOC team, out of these thousands of anomalies that I taught, or maybe another security product taught that are risky, you know what? We actually asked the users, and these are the five where the user couldn't prove his identity. These are your real incidents. And by the way, we blocked them. We didn't let them through. 
but you can now focus on these five, all the rest of them, you know what? We triggered step up authentication. The user told us it's him. It's much, much less risky. Let's focus on the ones where he couldn't. This is unique to identity. You don't get that with any kind of other detection or response at the endpoint, at the network. That's right. That's and why I think ITDR has even a bigger potential. The detection response in the other platforms enforces the negative. In other words, we found a, a potential bad actor, shut that bad actor off. Yeah. Whereas what you're talking about is now we can do the step up. We've confirmed a positive. Now we can actually you know, reduce that risk source so that the user has, a, has less friction throughout their journey. Yeah. I wanted to shift topics because you've been really generous with your time, but there was one more thing I wanted to hit, which is this ITDR space. It's, it's just becoming, it's entering my consciousness, right? So it's kind of like new for me anyway. Um, and I, I'm kind of tracing it back to the Gartner hype cycle, right? Because I think if you look at product uh, like single sign-on, IGA, privilege access management, it's gone all the way through the hype cycle. It's probably at this, what they call the plateau of productivity. Yeah. You look at zero trust, it's kind of like gone through it, and now it might be, you know, it might start, at some point it's going to get into this trough of disillusionment. And the reason I say that is not because to put down zero trust, I think zero trust is fantastic. But if there's the mentality that, hey, I'm just going to be able to cobble together some products or maybe buy one suite of products and be zero trust, that's a joke. That's not yes. what it is. So what I wanted to ask you is where is ITDR in this um, in this uh, hype cycle? And would you say that like a year from now, how does it look different? Are people – is it more – in more people's consciousness, are people saying this is just something you have to do? It's a great question, and I think that we are at a time where a lot of vendors will say we do ITDR, and a lot of customers will wrongfully think that ITDR is just one product you buy and you're, you're good. And it's not, just like zero trust, it's an approach. And you need to get all your solutions to work together around it. Um, so I think that there will be, for the next year or two, a lot of confusion. A lot of people will look at things that are actually mostly detection tools as ITDR. And, you know, a lot of products that were UEBA or doing different things to detect threats will now say, yeah, we're doing ITDR. And our response is that we send an alert to the SOC and then they do something about it. And what I hope will happen is, you know, slowly people will realize that the detection part has been there, you know, forever. But where it really you know, where ITDR is really an opportunity is to really connect the detection to the real-time active response to the enforcement. If we can do that, if we can take the detection that has been there, I mean, it, it, it is improving now, but it, it has been there for years, and we finally connect it to the enforcement, to the MFA, to the conditional access policies, to the things that actually stop attacks, if we finally make that connection, that is the opportunity of ITDR. And I think for the next year or two, people are going to be confused. They're going to look at detection tools that are repackaged as ITDR as if this is, you know, this is what they need. And I think slowly they will realize, okay, that's just sending us another alert. It's, it will not actually stop the attacks for us. And they will understand that ITDR is about the connection between detection and response, active response that actually stops attacks. And that is where it will get to a certain maturity where I do think that the impact, once it matures, once people do ITDR you know, this way, I think that the impact of this will be huge. I think that in terms of actually stopping attacks, this will be one of the most effective concepts or tools ever, simply because so many attacks involve identities. Without the identity element, they're probably much, much less risky. They will probably stay on one, two devices. they not be able to take over the entire network without you know, the identity element that is used to propagate. And second, because I think the response at the identity level, step up authentication, is such a great option for response because it's the perfect combination between security and productivity. You take action, real action, to prevent the attack without blocking your real legitimate users that are simply trying to work. You use step up authentication almost as a filter to stop only the real threats without bothering the legitimate users. I think this 
is where ITDR is going to be a game changer. But yes, it will take time for everybody to understand what is really ITDR and what is maybe just a piece of it, like detection. Yeah, thank you. It's very, very educational, very eye-opening, and it's going to be very interesting to watch this unfold, you know, over the next year or two, see, you know, I think kind of I hear one of your predictions is that there are going to be vendors trying to repackage old products as like, hey, this is now ITDR, zero trust and ITDR. So you could just like take care of all your problems with with our product. That's what I'm afraid of is the dilution of, of the terms. Yeah, right. It always happens, but I think customers will realize uh, – Eventually, it will take time, but it's okay, you know, for every category. But people will realize what is actually bringing them the value. Um, and also, I think that the detection tools still have a, a place. I think that, you know, I don't believe that any vendor has the solution for everything. We obviously don't. You know, we really try to connect with all of the other security products in order to, to work together. By the way, that's another concept Gartner is talking about, the, the mesh, mm -hmm. right? Everything needs to work together. So, yes. The detection tools also have a place. They can detect certain things. Maybe there's another product that can enforce, you know, and it all connects to all these different identity silos that will be connected. Everybody needs to work together. You know, no single vendor can say, I have the solution for everything. Um, and I think customers are starting to get that. Um, and I think where it will become very clear is once these solutions, and we are already seeing it with our product, will actually stop a lot of attacks that other tools don't. We stop an attack almost every week now, a real data breach on, on one of our customers. And I think people are telling each other that. They're saying, hey, you know what? I had a ransomware attack in my network. And you know, Silverfort actually saw it, stepped up the authentication to my user. The user didn't respond and, and it stopped. It stayed on the one initial endpoint, on patient zero endpoint. Yeah, it right. couldn't move anywhere else. And they're telling each other about it. You know what? It actually stopped the attack. Another thing that is driving awareness and influence in the industry is cyber insurance. A few years ago, I think people didn't really know what it will become. I think just like in other industries, eventually, it's not there yet, but eventually cyber insurance will signal to the customers what they need to do because they have a lot of data and they have a strong incentive <laughs> to actually get you to buy the product at stop attacks because otherwise they will pay a lot of money. So if they recognize, and I think they are starting to, that this is going to actually stop attacks and stop ransomware attacks uh, especially, they're going to force everybody to buy this. And I think it's a good thing because any single customer can be get confused with all these different vendors and messages. It's actually a good thing that you know, insurance will tell you, you know what, we have data from tens of thousands of customers and we can tell you if you get this product or this type of product, your risk actually goes down. So we'll only give you insurance if you buy it. I think that's a good thing. It's not there yet, but it's it will get there. Yeah, we've seen a lot of maturity in the <laughs> cyber insurance questionnaires that are going out. MFA yeah. a couple of years ago. What do you mean you're not doing MFA? Okay, now you need to because yes, you exactly. got to follow the money. And it's a good thing, I think. And yes, maybe the list is still not the full list of what people should do, but it's good because it it kind of puts a mirror in front of people. It's like these are the things you need to do because we believe that they reduce the risk the most. And it's it's good because it doesn't. It means that not every small company will need to do their own research and come to these uh, conferences. Um, you know, they will actually get a list of you know this is what you need to do to have a lower risk. Yeah. Um, and I think ITDR is going to be a big part of it. I mean, now it's uh, MFA and privilege access, but eventually all these things tied together into ITDR. It's protecting the identities. That's key to stopping attacks. You've been very eloquent in helping us understand ITDR, so I want to put that eloquence on display. What's the 30-second elevator pitch that you give to somebody when you're <laughs> like, okay, what do you do? Like, I'm silver for it. Okay, sell me. Sure. So what we do is we uh, extend uh, identity security controls such as multi-factor authentication, conditional access, everywhere even into places where they don't work today, the legacy protocols, the service accounts, you know, command line tools, all, all these things that people are actually targeting uh, in a way that doesn't require you to change any of the systems because we sit behind your existing identity infrastructure, we detect threats, and we enforce these security controls so that we can protect your identities everywhere. 
even in the places where security for identity is not available today. Um, and by the way, as you can understand from this you know, short explanation, I'm not focusing on ITDR. I think that in many ways this is ITDR, but I think that people will slowly understand what ITDR is and we can, you know, we can, do, we can help them. Uh, and, and the fact that you guys are doing this obviously helps people understand. But for now, we need to talk about the things that people really need to do. And it's about securing identities where I think one of the biggest gaps, you know, putting ITDR aside for a second, is the fact that modern identity security is only available for modern applications. It's available in the cloud, in Okta, in Azure AD. But for the, for the legacy infrastructure, for the on-prem, there's nothing. People are still using passwords and, and legacy protocols, and attackers know that. That's where they focus. The command line tools, the, the file shares, the service accounts, you know, machine-to-machine -machine access, the legacy infrastructure, that's where they go. So this is the main thing we're actually talking about today. I believe ITDR is the future. I believe this is what we're going to focus on. This is what we're going to do. But right now, to simplify this for the customers and help them solve a much more clear and immediate pain, my focus is actually on this. I'm telling them, you already have great solutions. You know, Azure AD is a great solution. It has MFA and conditional access and everything. But it only works for your web applications. It doesn't work for all these things I just mentioned. We can extend that because we work with all these vendors. So we can extend your Azure AD and Azure MFA to these places. I didn't even mention ITDR or zero trust or any of these concepts. Thank you. <laughs> it will actually help you achieve those things, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you extend modern identity security everywhere, you will actually achieve zero trust and ITDR. But I'm trying to focus on what are you actually getting? What, what is not protected today that we will protect for you? And I leave ITDR and zero trust to these kind of conversations where, you know, I do hope that people will adopt these concepts. Um, but I think people are tired of, of just hearing vendors only talk about the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about what the solution actually does and how it does it. Um, and that really resonates with people, I feel. Like in, this week was very, very clear. We just talked to people about, you know, what do you use today for MFA, for, for identity security? And they would say, you know, whatever vendor they have, great, probably works perfectly for your web applications, your modern applications, but how about all these other things, the legacy stuff, the command line tools, the service accounts, that's where attackers actually go because they know it's not protected. We can extend that solution that you already have over there. And that's such a clear story that is letting them extend an existing solution that they already invested in, that gives them great results in one environment, extend it to the other. So if you ask me what is the, the easy way, what is the way I, I'm, I'm explaining our product today, that's how I do. I think that um, we should really, I, I think every vendor should really try to focus on what are the clear issues that they solve and how they solve them. And, and yeah, we can talk about the concepts in order to educate the market, but uh, otherwise it becomes too confusing for people to just hear these buzzwords. So that simplicity in the language and ex explanation is something that is, I'm, I'm finding it to be more and more important because we get lost sometimes in flowery language, and yeah. it was, you know, it's been a focus here at the Gartner Conference as well around storytelling and, you know, really being articulate around the message. Um, you've been really great with your time, and I just want to, if we have just a couple more minutes, I want to ask you more questions from like a CEO perspective. Um, we were talking before we hit the record button, and you mentioned something about uh, retention and, and with where we are right now with great resignation and now quiet quitting, which is apparently a new thing that's out there. Um, what are some of the things that are secrets to success? And I'm sure you're going to share statistics, I hope you will, um, around finding and retaining talent. Because I think there's a lot of people who are trying to build teams. Yeah. Trying to find identity people is really hard right now. Yeah. Because you're taking care of hopefully the ones that are happy. And if you're trying to build a team, the pool of talent is, is, not, is, uh, is not where it needs to be. And I'm curious, from your perspective as you know the CEO of a corporation, uh, you know, a company, how are you doing that? Yeah, it's a very important topic. I think I think everybody has this problem of uh, talent in cybersecurity and identity. Um, and it's also, by the way, something that is very important to me specifically. Like one of the reasons I actually started a company, you know, besides wanting to invent, uh, you know, <laughs> ITDR and all these <laughs> great things, 
is actually that I wanted to build a company that, that I would have liked to, to work for, like a, a place that is actually um, you know, good for, for the people, a place where, where people like working with each other and believe in what they do. Um, because I, I want to wake up in the morning and go to a place where, where I enjoy what I do, right? Um, and it was very important for me all along to build this kind of culture where people really work together as, as one team without politics, without ego, you know, uh, just working as one team um, to the same goal. And I think we, we were able to achieve that. It becomes difficult when you grow fast. So, you know, we've been going very fast recently. You know, some of our teams like sales, marketing tripled since the beginning of the year. It's hard to keep the culture. I still meet everyone who joins the company, by the way, before, just to, not even to interview them professionally, but just to understand that I'm not going to lose that special thing that we have. But I think the most important part there is just caring about the employees, whether it's about their work-life balance or about the fact that they will be challenged with, with interesting things to do. Um, and, and just knowing that the company cares about them and then they care about the company. I, I don't believe in forcing people to work a certain number of hours a day. and Because people can, especially in, in the post-COVID world, it doesn't really matter. People can not do anything and you will never know. It's, it's very hard to know. So the only thing you can do is try to make them care about it. And that's never about the, the product or the, even the money. It's usually about the people. If you work with people that, that you like and you feel like they care about you and you feel like management is, is like in the same boat with you, um, people actually like it and stay. We had last year a little more than 1% of people leaving the company. We have 150 employees. Um, and, and I think it's because of that. So half a person left. How did that work? <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was two. <laughs> But um, I think that uh, another part of that is, is just how we react to the changes in the market. You know, last year was, was crazy. So many startups did crazy funding rounds with valuations that have nothing to do with the actual performance side. Uh, and they, they burned the money with, you know, fancy parties and whatever. And it, it's, it's, you know, great for them. But now when the market is down, a lot of these companies are, are letting go a lot of employees. And I think employees understand that you know, it's important to be in the company that cares about you, doesn't go crazy when the market is too optimistic and doesn't need to overcorrect at your expense, right? Because the CEO is probably still, you know, there, but <laughs> at the expense of some of these employees when things are bad. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, um, the other thing I just wanted to point out is as a smaller company, I think if you make a bad hire, bring in a toxic personality, just the... The, it has a magnifying effect of how how much damage that can do. I mean, that can that can hurt even at a big company, right? But with a small company, it's just magnified. So yeah. you interviewing everybody as they come in just to make sure that you're not going to upset that corporate culture, I think, is just so important. I, I just want to hire people that want to work in this mentality where we all work together. We, we help each other, even if it's not exactly, you know, someone's responsibility is not exactly getting paid on it. People will help each other because we all want to achieve the same goal. Um, and I want to find people like that. It's not easy, by the way, but there are a lot of people like that. I, I feel like we have a great team. And I will not continue to probably interview everybody, right? But I, I, I can trust my, my managers, my executive to do that. I, I think they, they get it completely. And I think it, uh, it's something that the whole company believes in, I think. Uh, but also part of it is, is this, you know, knowing how I make decisions, that I'm being responsible with you know, the company's goals and money. I think people care about that. Like they want to know that. And we are very transparent. I'm basically showing to the team every quarter, the same slides I'm showing to the board. You know, just this is where we are, this is all the data, this is the, the bad things, the good things. I think people appreciate that because they want to know that we're doing the right things and they can continue to believe in where the company is going. And I think the company is going in an amazing direction. We're, we're having great traction now. Uh, the potential of this space in general, but also just, just this solution is so big. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough, uh, a lot of the other part of is the people like um, people people leave great companies all the time because because of people because of a That's bad right. manager or a bad colleague 
That's the the saying that's out there, right? You know, people don't quit bad jobs; they quit bad managers. For sure. I think this is really good advice for you know. You're, we're talking about building company, but a lot of times you're building teams within a company, and this is great advice. Yeah. You know, build a team that you want to be a part of. You know, couldn't have said better myself. And you've been very generous with your time, so <laughs> I want to let you get back to to the show. But um, really appreciate you being here. I think uh, you know, for folks who are listening out there, want to learn more about Silverfort. Silverfort.com. I'll include a link in our show notes. Um, hopefully, you're okay with you know connecting with people on LinkedIn because we like to send yeah, of out course, of course. Uh, LinkedIn want to connections. Reach out directly. Happy to talk more about any of these topics. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and also for doing this. I mean, I think it really helps people in the industry to learn more about these things. Um, so thank you for for having me here and, and for doing this. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully people are listening out there. And if they're not, we'd still be doing it anyway. Um, <laughs> all right. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up a little bit here. Thanks again to the RSM team for hooking us up with this nice suite. Ghazi and Daniel are over on the other side of the room being quiet as mice watching the, the magic happen for Identity at the Center. Um, you can find us on the web, identityatthecenter.com. We're on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. And we'll go ahead and leave it there. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.